Good evening. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. We're going to take a couple of readings tonight. Luke chapter 5. We'll start in verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Skip down to verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. Let's pray together. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings that you've given us today. Father, we thank you for the refreshing rain that you are giving us. And we thank you, Father, for the way that you take care of our land and through that take care of us and our needs. We know, Father, that you are holy and that you are just, uh, but that, Father, you look down on us in loving kindness, that you take care of our needs, that you understand that we're frail and that we have, uh, that we have these needs, and you are good, Father, uh, to provide richly for us. Father, help us to recognize just how richly you have blessed us, how many things we have in our lives, and not just money, but all of the other resources that you have given us, um, all of the friends that we have, all of the opportunities that we have in life, the things that people from most of human history could not imagine. And Father, help us to recognize these all as blessings, but blessings in you, blessings that come from you, blessings that have their proper place in our worship to you, and that we can abuse these blessings, Father, that we can make these blessings more than they are. We can make them out to be more important and more essential than they are. We can give them more focus than they deserve. Father, Help us to follow the example of Simon and Levi, that we leave everything and follow you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We've noted this parallel before between these two episodes that we've looked at. Um, the first episode of Luke's well, seven-episode series in, in Luke chapter 5 and chapter 6 focuses on the calling of Simon. And at the end, Jesus tells him he is going to be catching men. All right, this is a commission to discipleship. And so when they bring their boats to land, they leave everything and they follow Jesus. All right, and Luke is not just commenting on how they you know, took a walk with Jesus. And that was it. Following Jesus refers to their discipleship here. And we note how Levi does exactly the same thing. Jesus comes up to him and he says, follow me. And Levi does exactly what Simon and the other fishermen did. He left everything and he followed Jesus. I want us to pursue this idea through the Gospel of Luke for just a little bit tonight. And I'm planning on keeping my comments rather short tonight. 
So I think the scriptures that we're going to look at will speak for themselves. This is a theme that Luke picks up and... If you, if this, isn't, this isn't even a good pun. This isn't even a good play on words, so you have to forgive me for this. But this is a theme that Luke follows throughout his gospel. The idea of leaving everything and following Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? We get several examples in the gospel of Luke. And we get explanations from Jesus himself. Turn to chapter 9. In verse 23, he's going, to, he's going to use some different language to explain what he means when he says, follow me, but what that entails. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you, truly, there are some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Jesus calls following him an act of taking up the cross daily. All right, so he's, he's explaining what he means with a metaphor. What's it mean to take up your cross? It's not without reason that Paul picks up on this same metaphor at the end of Galatians chapter 2 in that famous verse where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because what does it mean to take up your cross? Well, consider it in the literal sense. Where are you going if you're carrying a cross on your back? Where are you headed and what are you about to do? Remember what our Lord was doing. And by the way, he says, take up your cross and follow me. What is the Lord doing as he's walking in front of us? We know the Lord himself carried his cross as long as he could. And he carried it on, on the way to Golgotha, the place of the skull, where he would meet an earthly death. That's what it means to take up a cross. The cross is an execution sentence. It's a death sentence. It means that you are putting something to death or you're preparing to have something put to death. And that is what Jesus says we are to do. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. But there's some sort of, of death that we experience, or that we're supposed to experience as followers of Christ on a daily basis. Daily, we put something to death in following Jesus. And he puts it in these life and death terms. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Because what do we gain by not taking up the cross? You know, given a long enough period of time, everybody's chances of survival are zero. Right? Given enough time. You can't escape death. You can't escape losing everything in the end. What Jesus says is that there's, there's this odd thing. It, it's really counterintuitive to us. Right, as earthly creatures, we cling on to life and our sense of what life ought to be. Right? Life isn't just me continuing to exist. Life is me being happy. Life is me having a full belly. Life is me having a full pocketbook. Life is me having lots of friends. Life is, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is that keeps you from being miserable. In other words, what we say, what makes me happy. Um, and that is life. 
And Jesus says, that's not life. But ultimately, all of those things tend toward death. What really leads to life is denying yourself and taking up your cross daily and following me. Because whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, for my sake, will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? This is a difficult calling. And again, we're, we're speaking in metaphor here. Okay? Jesus is speaking in metaphor. Take up your cross daily. What does that look like on the ground? Right? That doesn't mean that he's not literally calling us to all go out and you know, pick up a railroad tie or some other big chunk of wood and go carry it around right? looking for somebody to crucify us. Uh, what does it look like on the ground for us to, uh, to die daily, to pick up our cross and carry it daily? He gives us a, another picture of this in Luke chapter 18. So go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 18. We get a specific example. Another person who is called to follow Jesus, to take up his cross and follow after Jesus. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. But you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. In other words, keep the law. Right? You know the law. Keep it. That's, that's the way to inherit eternal life. And the ruler says to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. Now, Jesus doesn't call him out and say, Oh, no, there's no way that you've actually kept the law. Right? And Jesus would be justified to do that. Right? That's part of the message of the New Testament, is that anybody who tries to keep the law fails, ultimately. That there's only one man who's ever lived who has actually kept the law, and that was Jesus of Nazareth. But for the rest of us, the law is a curse because we're not going to keep it. Jesus doesn't do that here. He doesn't call him out for exaggerating. What he says this, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. So for this rich young ruler, taking up his cross daily looks like this. I mean, Jesus lays it out for him in in, in stark terms, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And doesn't it fit that pattern that we just read in Luke chapter 9? Uh, that the person who tries to save his life will lose it, but the person who loses his life will gain it. And Jesus uses that same formula here. If you're trying to keep your stuff... Ultimately, you lose it. The, the prescription that Jesus gives is sell your stuff. Sell all that you have for my sake. Distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And that is what it looks like for this rich young ruler to take up his cross daily and follow Jesus. But when he heard these things, he became very sad. For he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, and who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Jesus' disciples, there are a few points in Scripture where Jesus' disciples will answer him back, essentially, and say, this is really hard, what you've just told us. Right? We have a similar occurrence in John chapter 6, whenever Jesus says that you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and the disciples say, this is difficult. 
or elsewhere where Jesus gives instructions about marriage and divorce. And they hear the teaching and they say, who on earth would get married? That is too difficult. And here, they do the same thing. How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Who can be saved, they ask. Now, by the way, these guys, these guys are not particularly wealthy. You know, Simon is a fisherman. He's not, he's not rolling in cash here, right? He's not like, you know, one of the prophets who... Um, or no, I'm thinking of somewhere else. You know, it's not that Simon can go out and every fish that he catches, you know, he can open up the fish and find money. Right? That only happens to one person one time in Jesus' presence. Simon is not making a lot of money. Most of the other apostles are not making a lot of money. But they understand this is difficult. Who can be saved? And this ought to trouble us, by the way. This ought to trouble us a lot. Um, because like, most of us don't understand how well off we are. Consider the context of Jesus the first century, the ancient world, the vast, vast majority of people were subsistence farmers. You know what subsistence farming means, right? I mean, I grew up on a farm, but it wasn't subsistence farming. All right, we farmed for a profit. That means that my dad, he sold most of the stuff that he farmed, right? We laid up corn and... Um, it was mostly corn that we ate off of. Way too much corn. But we had lots of corn for ourselves. Spend the whole summer eating corn. Spend the whole fall and winter eating corn. And we would have a couple of freezers full of beef. And you would know, take care of the family. But we also had enough corn and enough beef and wheat and soybeans and milo and you know, a few other things that dad could make a pretty handy profit. You're not going to get rich by American standards doing that. But that's way better than subsistence farming. You know what subsistence farming means? That means you farm to eat to live. And that's it. You have enough food to live. You don't have enough food to sell to somebody else. Uh, you don't have enough food to... Half the time, you don't have enough food for everybody in your family to be satisfied. Right? And that was over 90% of people in the ancient world. They were subsistence farmers. And here, in that context, Jesus is telling us how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Brethren, do we have wealth? When we look at what Jesus was addressing, when we look at the standard of Jesus' day, we have wealth. This should trouble us. Now, on the flip side, we also have to acknowledge this, that when we go back to Luke chapter 5, and we read that Levi, the tax collector, left everything and followed Jesus, the very next thing that we read Levi doing is that he made Jesus a great feast in his house. Right, so Levi is following Jesus as a disciple, and Luke tells us that he has left everything. Yet he, still, he has the resources, and he has the house, by the way. He's hosting it in his house, and he has the resources to throw a great feast for Jesus. So it's not necessarily that the call to follow Jesus is a call to renounce all earthly goods. Um, more than likely, well, we, we can ask it as a question at this point and maybe fill in the answer later. Why is it that Jesus tells the rich young ruler that he needs to sell everything that he has and distribute to the poor? Why is it that he asks the rich young ruler that? And once we have an answer to that, then maybe we can answer the question for ourselves. What do we think the Lord requires of our earthly goods when it comes to taking up our cross daily and following Him? 
Because we, I think like the disciples, we see something like this and we're taken aback by it. And we, likewise, think this is extremely difficult. Who can be saved? If this is the standard that Jesus is setting, if He's saying sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, if that's the standard, if it's that uh, people who are wealthy have such a hard time getting into the kingdom of God that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom, uh, who can bear this? And Jesus, by the way, addresses some of these concerns, that His calling is difficult. And He does not necessarily address it in the most complimentary terms. Go to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 and verse 15. Jesus tells a parable. We'll get a little bit of setup to this parable. Uh, Jesus is dining at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, and I mean, there are several uh, pieces of conversation that are recorded from that dinner in Luke chapter 14 for us. But we're going to focus on one. In verse 15, when one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, so the things that he'd been saying, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he, that is Jesus, said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out and go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my banquet. So Jesus leaves us with this parable that seems to be telling us about entrance into the kingdom of God. Uh, That the kingdom of God is like... A man who once has a, once had a great banquet and invited many. In other words, we're all invited to enter the kingdom of God. But, as Jesus has said, following Him is no easy thing. Following Him is a matter of taking up your cross daily. And some of us, as we consider the cost, we start to question the cost. And we start, well, in Jesus' terms, we start making excuses. Remember, all of these guests that are invited to the banquet, they come up with these excuses, and they're really lame excuses. Hey, look at that last guy. I just got married. I can't come. What does that have to do with anything? It's like, I own an umbrella. I'm sorry, I can't come. What on earth? That's, that's not even a reason. Like You're not even trying. Um, and the other two seem just as silly. I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. You know, like you're going to go out and purchase a piece of land without inspecting it first. Right? I mean, we just, we just finished selling our house. Praise the Lord for that. That is a, a, uh, an answer to a long prayed prayer. Um, and you know how many times that place got inspected? Tons. This woman did not buy the house from us and then say, well, I guess I better go look at it. Oh, she looked at it. Many, many times before the sale happened. This guy, I bought a piece of land, I need to go look at it, so I can't come to dinner. Really, like, the land is going somewhere? You need to catch the land before it leaves, and so you can't go to dinner first? Lame excuse. 
You know, sometimes they say lame excuse is better than none, but I don't know if that counts here. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Again, same problem. You know, who's going to buy a yoke of oxen without having them looked at first? At least these can run away, right? whereas the land can't. Um, but still, a lame excuse. And then I got married. Marriage is not that bad. All right? Marriage is pretty great. Right? You're not going to, to say, oh, I have a wife, I can't come. All of these are lame excuses. And God does not put up with our lame excuses. Right? Whenever, whenever Jesus comes to Levi and says, follow me, Levi does not say, well, i got to man the tax booth. No, he just gets up and he follows him. And Simon and the other fishermen, uh, they don't stop to say, well, you know, we've got to get the boat put up, we've got to get the nets cleaned, we've got to get everything fixed and put away. They leave everything and they follow Jesus. And sometimes our excuses, they don't seem so lame to us. Um, but they are lame. Jesus is actually rather strict about this. Um, you know, there are, there are places in the Gospels where people offer to follow after Jesus. And Jesus more or less turns them down. Tells them that they're really not interested in following him. Um, because the things that they come up with are actually rather lame excuses. Go to Luke chapter 9, towards the end of the chapter, uh, about verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Others, he's calling into question this guy's commitment to actually follow Jesus wherever he goes. To another, he said, follow me. All right, so the same call that we saw him issue to Levi. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. All right, now... In the realm of excuses, that actually seems like a pretty decent excuse, right? That's not like, I just got married. I can't follow you. It's, My father just died. Let me go bury him. And Jesus, Jesus calls him out on it and says, basically, this is the lame excuse. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. In other words, that thing that you think is more important than the spiritual realm, the spiritual life, is not more important. Uh, and this man is preferring the realm of the dead to the realm of, of life, of eternal life. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. All of these things, lame excuses. They don't fly. So, you know, whereas all of those guests that were invited to the, the great banquet, you know, their excuses, they were obviously lame. These, you know, they seem somewhat reasonable. And yet Jesus still shoots them down. That's not a valid excuse. All right, You're, you don't get it. Follow me. And the last thing that he says should bring something to mind to us. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. In the whole course of the Bible, in the whole narrative of the Bible... Who do we think of as the person who turns back or the person who looks back? Lot's wife. What happens to Lot's wife? Right? And it's not just that she, she just turned around, like she couldn't resist a glimpse of the awesome fireworks that were going on behind her. The sense that we get from the text is that despite all of this violence and wickedness that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife missed it. Like she knew that she she didn't want to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Uh, Because that's the sense that the Bible uses whenever it talks about turning back. Like Israel, in their hearts, turned back to Egypt. They wanted to return to their situation. And they get called out for being faithless. And Lot's wife gets turned into a pillar of salt. And Jesus invokes that language here. No one that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. It points in Luke's Gospel, uh, Jesus, you know, if the story of the rich young ruler seems extreme to us, uh, and in telling the rich young ruler to renounce earthly goods, uh, distribute everything that he has to the poor, and follow him, if we think that sounds extreme, we have not seen Jesus at his most extreme. Go to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And by the way, we're going to pick up right after that parable. All right? Immediately after that parable, all of these guys that have their lame excuses. Jesus gives us a more literal picture of what he considers to be a lame excuse. Uh, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not, here we've heard this language before, right? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no use, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus lays this out in the starkest terms for us. And if we think that it is, it sounds crazy to renounce all earthly goods, Jesus has just taken this to a whole new level of crazy, right? from, from an earthly perspective. Any one of you who does not renounce all cannot be my disciple. And notice all the family ties. Anyone who comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even himself, cannot be my disciple. And again, consider what this means in the ancient world. What is your family in the ancient world? In the ancient world, you typically did not pick up and leave. Like, you didn't leave home to go to college or something. You didn't find yourself settling in a different state than your parents lived in. Most people uh, died in the same place that they were born, which also happened to be the same place that their father uh, died and was born, and that his father died and was born, and so on and so on. You stayed with your family because your family was your safety net. Right, consider all of the laws in the Old Testament that require your family members to redeem things, to redeem land that you've had to sell off, uh, to redeem you if you've had to sell yourself off into slavery. Um, your family is constantly there to bail you out because guess what? There's nobody else to bail you out. You don't, you, get, you don't have food stamps in the ancient world. You don't have a food pantry in the ancient world. You don't have police in the ancient world. You don't have anybody who's going to take care of you in the ancient world other than your mother and your father and your brothers, um, your family. And Jesus says you have to be willing to forego all of that. Right? He's not just talking about relationships here. He's talking about security. 
Right? And he's talking about it in the most profound terms that we can think of. He who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And so we, like the disciples, might ask, who then can be saved? How does this work? How are we going to, if this is what it means to take up our cross and follow Jesus, who can do it? Because this does seem like death. To renounce everything. Well, I want us to return to that question. What is it about the rich young ruler? Why does Jesus ask the rich young ruler to... He doesn't say, renounce your father and your mother. He just says, sell all that you have. I think we see why he asked the rich young ruler to do that in the rich young ruler's reaction. Because what does a rich young ruler do? He goes away sorrowful. Because he had a lot. He was wealthy. It was, as Jesus himself says, it's the one thing that he lacked. It's the one thing that he was putting over and above his discipleship to Jesus. The one thing that he was putting ahead of God. And so Jesus said, get rid of it. And come follow me. And he couldn't do it. This is an invitation... All of the things that that Jesus talks about here is an invitation for us to consider in our own lives what things we put in front of God. In other words, what things we give precedence over God. Is it a family relationship? Is it money? Is it comfort? Is it leisure? Whatever it is, Jesus says it has no business being there. That you were to put self to death to be a follower of Jesus. It brings to mind, and I know we looked at this passage on Thursday, um, but I think it bears repeating. Philippians chapter 2. This is the picture that Paul gives us. This, by the way, is another picture of what it means to follow Jesus. Paul tells us to follow after the example of Jesus. Let's back up to verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, we can stop there. Taking up your cross daily and following Jesus means looking beyond yourself. He begins this encouragement by asking us to consider what the other people around us need. To not only consider our own interests, but to consider the interests of others. And to take on the example of Jesus, who made himself a slave for mankind who submitted himself, in a way, to the interests of other people. And that's where all of this is coming from, by the way. All of this that we read in Luke about taking up your cross and following Jesus, it all comes from who we're following. We look in Luke chapter 9. This is right before that first passage that we looked at. We started in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. We're going to go back to verse 18. 
We're going to get a little context for Jesus saying, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The context is this. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they said, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah. And others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. In taking up our cross and following Jesus, we are imitating our Master. Because that's what Jesus does. Jesus dies for others. Uh, Jesus does whatever it takes to obey His Father. And that is the call that He gives to us. And anything that stands between us and following Him, us and obedience to the Father, has to go. Anything. All right, whenever Jesus says, you know, does your hand cause you to stumble? Is your eye causing you to sin? Get rid of it. Well, in a sense, he's speaking metaphorically. But I think we would be wrong to limit that to a metaphor. I, I think that if we really were sinning on account of one of those things, and we went into the judgment having not gotten rid of them in the way that Jesus says... I think God's probably going to challenge us on that. It sounds extraordinarily extreme. It sounds ridiculous from a worldly perspective uh, to say, there could be a situation where you need to cut off your own hand. Jesus says there is. I trust Jesus on that. I pray that it never happens to me because I'm literally attached to my hands. But the question he challenges us with is, would you do it? If it was required of you, would you do it? Would you cut ties with that person that is leading you away from following? Would you cut ties with your own hand? Would you cut ties with your earthly wealth if it stands in the way of following? That is the challenge. All of this, by the way, comes with a reward. It is not all give. It is not all risk. There is reward to this. If you go back to Luke chapter 18, right after the disciples have asked who can be saved, and right after Jesus says what is impossible with man is possible with God, in verse 28, Peter says, See, we have left our homes and followed you. Right, now, usually, whenever somebody tries to make some sort of boast to Jesus, and we've already seen this, by the way, anytime somebody tries to represent themselves as doing good you know, before Jesus, Jesus calls them out on it. Right? He lays them on the floor. But not here. Peter says, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. He doesn't knock Peter out here. He doesn't say, No, you haven't. Quit exaggerating, Peter. He says, that's good. Because if you've done that, you'll receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. Please take out your songbooks. Give me uh, 805. 805. So instead of number 802, we'll do number 805. Oh, why not tonight? That is the question, eternal life. And remember, that's what the rich young ruler was asking about. What do I do to gain eternal life? 
And Jesus says, Sell everything you have, distribute to the poor, and come follow me. He has the same message for us. Take up your cross daily and follow me. And by the way, that's why we see what extraordinary faithfulness this is that Luke shows us in chapter 5. Whenever Peter leaves everything and follows him, and whenever Levi leaves everything and follows him. All right, this is, that's exemplary faith in Luke chapter 5. And the question is, are we doing the same thing? Are we bearing our cross daily? Or do we have things where we try to cheat God? You know, we try to have... We try to treat God like a side hustle. Right? Our main thing is being happy and being warm and being fed and having these nice relationships. Um, And we can have that going on and we can also have our devotion to God going on. Um, The Gospel doesn't invite us to to treat God like a sideshow. God's the main thing. Anything that wants to try to put God... The second fiddle, second act has got to go. So consider that tonight. Have you taken up your cross? Are you following Jesus? Or have you allowed something to enter into your life that needs to be gotten rid of? And if there is something that you you require help with, um, if there is a public confession of sin that you need to make, or if you just have something that's weighing on you and that you want us to pray about it, um, or if you've... If you feel you have fallen away from this calling and need to be rejoined to it, whatever your need is to get right with God, uh, we urge you, don't wait to another time to do it. Tonight's the night to take care of it. So come forward as together we stand and sing.